Hello guys, welcome to my build of Trumpeter's 135th scale landing craft mechanized LCM. As you can see from the box, this is a big kit, but that shouldn't be surprising given that an LCM is 50 feet long or 50 meters long. It is worth pointing out that despite what the box art might imply, we do not get a tank and we do not get a crew with this kit, it's just the landing craft. The side of the box shows us the same paint scheme as the front artwork, which is the sort of blue-grey uh, US scheme. This does include parts for the British version of the LCM, which is ever so slightly different, but that British version is a bit of an afterthought, which I'll, uh, I'll show you in a moment as we go through the instructions. So looking inside, there's surprisingly little plastic in here. The box is dominated by this huge single piece hull here. Of course, that's going to make construction much easier. No corners to align, no, no things to get square. And surprisingly as well, no big seam line or mould line all the way down the, uh, the piece. These lines on the side here are weld seams, which are quite well done. We have another sprue with two large pieces that form the insides of the, um, well, sort of the cargo bay area, the interior. A couple of large pieces here that form the deck and the, um, the roof of the engine room, the deck at the rear. A couple of smaller pieces, one single U-shaped piece, which is the walkway all around the deck. And some parts here for that door at the front. And again, quite a low parts count here. So most of that door is that single piece there with all that detail on it. We then have two lots of this sprue, which is some smaller details. And finally, some photo etch, which I'll only be using a little bit of because most of it is for the 50 cal machine guns, which are not included on the British version. So looking at the instructions, construction starts by adding the rudder and the propellers to the underside. I'm not going to do that straight away because I can pretty much guarantee they'll get knocked off at some point during construction. So that's probably the last step I will do, to be honest. We have a small armoured compartment for the driver with a different piece at the front for the US versus the British version. The instruction manual is not great at pointing out those differences. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. But what is quite useful is a lot of the pieces require holes to be drilled into them and those holes are very clearly marked USN for the US version and uh, RN for the, uh, the Royal Navy version. So as long as you follow those markings on the pieces, it's hard to go wrong. Step 3 has us constructing the ramp and that should be movable in the final version. Then we have the engine deck here at the rear and the inner deck with two sides on it. That inner deck slides there inside the, uh, the external hull. And then a few bits and pieces with details. Uh, I've got some life rings and things on the next page and a few other odds and ends. Then here on page eight, we add the machine guns, which are only for the American version. The instructions are odd. They tend to tell you if something is needed for the British version but they don't tell you if something is not needed for the British version. So you can see here for the machine guns, it doesn't say anything about them being only for the US version, even though they are. And then down here at the bottom of page eight, we see this ladder, which is just for the British version. Unfortunately, back on page four, we added another ladder, which is for the US only version. And nothing in that step says, only add this ladder if you're doing the US version. So you do this here on step four, and then when you get to step eight, oh, by the way, don't do that thing on step four. So that's what I mean when I say that it's a little bit of a, uh, an afterthought to include the British version. Also, we don't get any decals for the British version in this kit. Also, we have the paint scheme here. Now, I suppose this paint scheme could apply to the British version as well, but the decals don't as far as I'm aware. Now I'm going to build mine as the British version and I'm also going to do a slightly different paint scheme with the white and the blue, which is quite common on British um, transports, landing craft. Moving on to the construction of the wheelhouse, 
It wasn't initially clear from the instructions whether the side piece of this butts up against the front or whether the front butts up against the side piece, if you see what I mean. And basically I had to work that out by using the top piece as a guide and making sure everything fitted correctly there. Before I glued these together however I did fill and sand all of those ejector pin marks on the inside because they will be highly visible. We have a small control panel in the wheelhouse too. Both of those pieces were kept separate so they could be painted more easily. Also to help ensure everything was square I used the engine deck as a guide. Here you can see on the bottom of the engine deck piece the example of those uh, drill marks that I was uh, talking about. So I'm looking for any that are marked for RN for Royal Navy. Here's another example of how you have to be a bit careful reading the instructions. So we're building the engine deck here. We have very clearly got some things to add on the left hand side. And then we've got the British version there on the right hand side. Now it's not clear from the British version, but I assumed that those parts there, D9, on the American version, would also fit on the British version. Because if they don't, you've got some holes directly into what would be the engine room below. On the other hand, I didn't fit those circular parts, D16, to my version, because they go into some slots which you have to cut out of the engine deck, and those cutouts are marked as USN. So yes, I do think the trumpeter seemed to have taken the most confusing approach possible here. This is the rear of the cargo bay and again I think it's only really the annotations on the drill holes that prevent us from putting the wrong ladder in place. The loading ramp is a relatively easy construction. A single large piece fits inside an even larger main piece. And then we just have a few final bars to uh, put in place over there. The door attaches to the craft with quite a nice little um, tooth mechanism here. We go above and below the hinge and that enables the door to be moved. In general, I'm not a huge fan of moving parts on a kit, but here I think it works quite well, and it's useful to keep the, the ramp separate for painting. It also means I don't need to decide just yet how I want to display this uh, craft. The next step was to put the rails on the outside of these um, cargo bay walls. The outer walkway will butt up to the bottom of these rails, so any marks there, those ejector pin marks below there, will not be seen. So the internal cargo bay is a fairly straightforward four piece bathtub style construction. Single large piece for the floor, two large pieces, one for each side, and then the backing wall to keep everything together and square. I did build that and while the glue was still not fully dry I glued the outer walkway to the hull and I tried to squeeze the inner cargo bay into place. Basically I wanted all of that to go into place at the same time so that everything could uh, line up and uh, match and everything would be nice and square. As it turned out it wasn't perfect still but it made things a bit easier. Here you can see the result once the glue has dried. It wasn't perfect, there were still a few slightly loose areas, so I did go back and try to get some glue in those using a, uh, a small uh, piece of cardboard to try and feed the glue in the gaps. But in general, at this stage, the craft felt pretty sturdy. 
There was also a small amount of overhang of the external walkway over the side of the craft. And of course, once that's set up, it's really hard to pull the wall of the craft outwards because you've got nowhere to get any leverage on it. So in the end, I did have to do a small amount of sanding of that walkway to bring it flush with the edge of the craft. Once that's all set up and dry, however, we're basically on the home straight. We have a few pieces to add and we switch to photo etch parts as well. So we have a single piece fire extinguisher with a vinyl tube. A couple of pieces for the control mechanism for the ramp. I put these together and with hindsight it would have been wise not to do that at this stage because the string which is supplied to represent the cable for the ramp needs to be threaded through these. We also move on to some photo etch. We have four of these uh, triangular brackets which you can see in the background there and also four of these hooks which have to be bent into shape. I just use the handle of a paintbrush. And those are used to hold the life rings on the inside of the craft. The placement for those triangular brackets is very nicely marked as you can see, so you shouldn't be able to get those in the wrong place. We do have these small handles which are, I guess essentially are um, locks to hold the ramp closed. I didn't add these at this point because again I haven't quite decided yet whether or not to have the ramp open or closed. And although the ramp is movable in the model, there's no way to fix those handles so that they are movable. Trumpeter do like to give us a bit of multimedia in this kit, so we've had plastic and photo etch so far. The next step requires us to add this brass wire, five per side. It doesn't tell you how long to cut the pieces. I divided the 120 millimeters of wire into 10, like it says, but the resultant 12 millimeters was a little bit too long, so I think 10 millimeters is probably best. I did a fairly good job on this side, I think. Not such a good job on the other side, which is why I'm not showing it to you. Some string is supplied for the cable for the ramp, and also for these, um, I forget what they're called now, they hang over the side of the craft. I can't think of the name of them. Anyway, they're supposed to hang off the side like so. So I cut the string to length. Rather than faffing around tying it, I simply super glued it, figuring that the the join would be behind, um, out of out of sight anyway. Figuring that the join would be out of sight anyway. With that all done, I decided to go back to step one and fit the rudders. Although the propellers go in here as well, I decided to keep those separate for painting. I thought that might be significantly easier. We don't get any painting instructions during the build of this kit, so I'm not quite sure what colour they should be, but that should be reasonably easy to research. I would imagine the propellers would be some kind of brass colour. With that in mind, here is our landing craft itself, ready for painting. And here are the parts that will be painted separately. So in terms of paint schemes, the instructions give us a plain scheme for the British version of the LCM, which is accurate, but I also prefer this alternative scheme, which is seen in some reference photos. I know not all of these photos are LCMs, but they illustrate the scheme quite well. The colours are somewhat disputed for this. They are either a white or a light grey, with either a blue-grey B15 or B30, as the disruptive colour. I think it looks like quite a good scheme. I went for an overall coat of Tamiya Primer with some NATO black pre-shading. As you can see I put a lot of this pre-shading on the inside and less on the outside. Then I gave the exterior a coat of XF2 white, thinned quite a lot, and you'll notice I've painted the white in vertical streaks. The idea here to be sort of doing some kind of sort of pre-shading with kind of a, an initial weathering uh, pass on that.
For the blue disruptive colour I used Tamiya XF18 and I took some of my favourite Tamiya masking sheets, cut to the right shape to mask that off. I really love this masking sheet, it's fantastic stuff. Far better than using um, tape and trying to get the tape to curve and so on. I applied the XF18 in a similar way, i.e. vertical streaks. And then I got to peel off the masking tape and I was really pleased with the way this came out. Let's have some more gratuitous demasking shots. I think that looks really good overall. You'll notice that for the inside I went over with a light grey. Some sources said the interior was dark grey, some of the reference photos seem to suggest that, but it just didn't look right to me, so I think this was XF19 um, light grey. Unfortunately the trumpeter kit doesn't include any decals for the British version, so for the distinctive LCM markings on the sides, I took some Tamiya gridded paper sketched out a approximate pattern and was then able to cut that out with a sharp knife. Of course the 8 was quite difficult but I did try to uh, keep those central circle bits. The end result of that wasn't too bad, obviously the C's not fantastic there and the 2's not fantastic, but I think with a combination of touch-ups and weathering that can be made to look better. I certainly think it looks better than not having it there at all. What doesn't look good is the string rope that's provided. It's gone all fluffy. I tried to paint it with a metallic colour, but it didn't really work. I'm very tempted to replace this with something else, but before I do that, I need to try to find out whether this is rope or chain in the real LCM3s. The life rings were painted. I know these weren't necessarily red. I've seen a variety of colours. A few of them are white or light grey. I went for red to break it up a bit. Equally I painted the fire extinguisher red. And again I know that's not necessarily the standard colour for the time period. But I think there is some evidence to suggest that some fire extinguishers were red. The bronze for the propeller was painted with this acrylic from Ammo by MIG. We don't get any decals for the instrument panel, but to be honest these are fairly easy to paint by hand. The gauges are nice and deep, so the easiest way I find to paint these is to use a fairly thin white paint and almost sort of let it uh, run itself, find its own way inside each of the dials um, and fill to the edges. Once that's dried I can go back and paint the uh, rims of the dials or the needles and so on. This is in no way accurate painting. I don't even know if the piece accurately represents the uh, control panel for the LCM or not. Being fairly heavily used vessels, I wanted some strong weathering on this for a change. I started with a heavy dry brush of a metallic colour over the top deck, focused on many of the areas which would be most accessible or most used. and of course doing the same down in the cargo deck, especially over those raised bumps. And here my brush is deliberately not quite as dry as it might normally be, so some of that metallic paint is going on the areas between those bumps to represent scrapes from cargo and vehicles, etc. Next up was oil paints, which I thinned with odorless thinner, and then put directly onto the matte surface of the paint. The matte surface lets the oil paint seep in a bit more, it makes clean up a bit harder, but it was a deliberate choice in this case because I kind of wanted that um, ingrained, dirty look. It looks quite harsh at the moment and of course I will feather the edges of those, but I do want it to look heavily used. This is Abtai Lung 502's sepia oil colour. And here I am just blending that slightly.
The top deck was given a similar treatment, although obviously not quite so severe because there's no vehicles driving over here. But a pin wash around the major details. Blended in. Still with oil paints but with a lighter buff colour, I added dots to the side of the hull on the exterior and streaked them downwards to represent general sort of rain streaks and dirt streaks and so on. And then in some smaller, more specific areas, some crusted rust deposits from AK. Applied as small streaks. Feathered and thinned with some enamel thinner. And for now, that was really all I wanted to do in terms of weathering on this. There are certainly some things that still need doing, such as those vertical weld seams down the side there that will need the pin wash. But I decided to leave things as they are for the moment. It might not surprise you to know that I've got a diorama idea for this LCM. It might surprise you to know that I'm not just saying that, I've actually got some of that in progress. And in fact you can see some shots of that on the screen now. That's not too far from completion, I'm just looking for some figures for it. In the meantime, I will leave you with some shots of my LCM. I'll say thank you to everyone for watching, and a special thanks to my YouTube supporters and my Patreon members. And if you would like to see the final diorama with this LCM, then please remember to subscribe and hit the notifications button if you haven't already. I will leave you with some photos, and until the next video, have fun modelling.